Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a really exciting moment for all of us today. The Illuminating Hidden Harvest Initiative has been ongoing for more than four years. And today we're going to have a first look at some of the key results. So as we wait for more people to join the webinar, we're gonna be in a few minutes watching a short video about the vital contributions of small scale fisheries. So we're gonna give people a couple more minutes uh, we'll start the video and then we'll start the webinar. Thank you again for joining us. Fantastic. Well, uh, again, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world, good evening, hopefully not good middle of the night. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on behalf of the Illuminating Hidden Harvest team. My name is Vera Agostini, and I am a Deputy Director of the Fisheries and Aquaculture Division at FAO. It's a real pleasure to be with you uh, all here today. Um, this is very exciting work we're about to share. Now, before we start, I have a few housekeeping notes to highlight. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available afterwards on the FAO Illuminating Heaven Harvard website. So we will post a link to this website in the chat before we finish here today. Also be aware that there is interpretation today in Spanish and French and can be selected at the bottom of your um, screen in the bottom bar. Now you can see in the lower bar on Zoom that we have a chat uh, and a Q&A. Please share any general comments in the chat and specific questions in the Q&A. We aim to address these in the Q&A session or directly in the chat and Q&A section. And if we cannot do that here today, uh, we will attempt to do so in a Q&A document that will also be posted on the website. Now, I also want to kindly remind you to please keep your microphones on mute. Uh, our panelists, especially to mute their microphones when not speaking so as to not create interference. And I will try to remember to do the same. Also, by now, we're all very used to virtual meetings. Uh, audio quality may deteriorate unexpectedly. So we, we, just, we just want you to be aware of that um, and, and, and just you know, let us know if you're, if you're experiencing some issues. Now, what I would like to do here uh, now is hand the floor over to, our, um, to some of our partners, Toddy Steelman and Gareth Johnson for some opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vera. I was having a little bit of trouble with my, um, my video, um, but thank you very, very much. Um, for decades, researchers at Duke and elsewhere have documented the rich diversity of aquatic food gathering activities in coastal and inland waters around the world. Aquatic environments connect families, households, communities, shaping biocultural landscapes and local and national economies in the process. Fishing is as old as humanity 
and fish trade is one of the oldest forms of social exchange. Despite this richness and historical importance, the contributions of small scale fisheries remain dispersed, hidden and underappreciated by most of society. Their continued invisibility has had important environmental justice and gender inequity implications too. For instance, the role of women in fishing is mostly invisible. The Illuminating Hidden Harvest Research Initiative that is the partnership between Duke, FAO and World Fish will add the important work being done by other research groups and practitioners and will also help tilt the balance towards increased policy attention to the contributions that small scale fishers and fisher workers make to equitable and sustainable development. This new and improved knowledge on small scale fisheries will help decision makers to better include small scale fisheries and policies and actions so that their potential can be realized and contribute to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. The Illuminating Hidden Harvest Initiative also has so far involved 25 Duke students at various levels and capacities. Take for instance, the example of postdoctoral associate Marmancha, who co-led the methodological design, training of country case study experts and data compilation among other tasks, or Ben Siegelman, who took on the role of acting project coordinator after graduating from our coastal environmental management program. The opportunity to expose students to multidisciplinary studies like IHH, have them experience problems of social and planetary concern truly prepares our students to meet current and future environmental challenges and truly appreciate how to connect science and policy. It is an amazing way for our school to accomplish its mission. So thank you so very much for allowing us to participate in this process. Thank you very much, Toddy. Uh, I am now going to hand the mic over to Gareth Johnson, Director General of World Fish, to give some opening remarks. And I forgot to mention that Toddy Steelman is the Standback Dean of the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. And thank you. Gareth, over to you. Thanks, Vera. And thank you, Toddy, uh, for those opening remarks. And good afternoon and welcome everybody who has joined us from around the world. and. Uh, to learn more about the early results of the Illuminating Hidden, Hidden Harvest study, an exciting and comprehensive piece of research to provide small scale fisheries the attention they deserve in terms of policies, investments and our collective actions. First, let me just thank everybody, all the small scale fishing communities, civil society actors, scientists, policy makers and many partners at local and national levels, the FAO and Duke University as our co-leads in this study for their immense effort, ideas, enthusiasm and proactive engagement in helping bring this important body of work to light. I will let the teams do the talking on the specific results and insights stemming from the study. However, an important outcome that has already emerged is one we should feel very proud about is the vast and diverse network of over 800 international experts across government agencies, academia, civil society, and local fishing communities across more than 50 countries. The Illuminating Hidden Harvest Study is already empowering the diverse constellation of actors to expand their partnerships and use this much needed evidence to advocate for better recognition of small scale fisheries as crucial to global food systems and to provide fishers, fish workers, their champions and organizations, the evidence-based messages to advocate for human rights approaches to sustainable small scale fisheries. Today, uh, research reveals that the contributions of the millions of women and men working in small scale fisheries helps FAO member states uh, um, work, um, make progress towards not only the SDG 14 on life below water, but also uh, score progress on other important SDGs such as climate change, hunger and malnutrition, poverty, gender equality, fair work, human and environmental health. Illuminating Hidden Harvest is about making visible what has been invisible for so long. Is about shining the spotlight on the formidable force of small scale fishery sector. This study is quite timely, particularly in the light of major COVID-19 disruptions, 
on local and global food supply chains and people's livelihoods. Building forward a better future that is sustainable, resilient, inclusive and equitable must include work to support small scale fisheries and the communities that depend on them. Robust data and evidence like the one being discussed today is crucial also to guide the work of FAO member states in successfully implementing the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fisheries. The 2022 International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, which FAO officially launched last week, provides a great opportunity for us to support, resource and expand this wonderful network beyond this study and to mobilize a global movement for transformational and meaningful change. It is in this network and how we use it is to benefit the small scale fisheries sector moving forward where the immense value of its hidden harvest really lies. We need to leverage the evidence we have generated and the collective power of this incredible community to inform and complement the global call to action for a food systems transformation for healthier and sustainable diets with important small scale fisheries perspective on food, nutrition, equity, and social justice and environmental sustainability to secure a strong voice and a seat at the table for representatives of small scale fisheries in important national, regional and global policy processes. To build a compelling business case for supporting the sector and recognizing its contributions to our global food systems. And to argue that support for and investment in small scale fisheries is support for an investment in COVID-19 recovery solutions and climate action. Uh, thank you for your participation. I look forward to the webinar. Thank you. Back to you, Vera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tadia and Gareth, for these inspiring remarks. And thank you for all that you do to support this incredible partnerships. Uh, the IH study is truly a global effort. It's, it's clear more than 800 experts worldwide have contributed to the country and territory case studies thematic studies and reviewing the results. So, you know, we're going to learn about that. And, and really, I am personally very impressed with this global effort. Now, what we're going to do is watch a video to see some of the people who contributed, bring them to life and to learn more about the IHH, IHH approach. The contribution of a small scale fishery to sustainable development are often undervalued or overlooked. This results in missed opportunities to progress the sustainable development goals. And in the worst instances, small-scale fisher and fish workers experiencing increased marginalization. And exclusion from governance, spaces and resources. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, or FAO, Duke University and the World Fish team up in 2017 to help address this issue. By launching the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Global Initiative. This initiative will help to further improve methods and capacities to collect, analyze and use data in support of small-scale fisheries. As the basis for sound and inclusive policy making and resource governance. A major output of this initiative is a research report that uses a multidisciplinary approach to assess and broaden our understanding of the values of marine and inland small-scale fisheries globally. The report looks holistically at small-scale fisheries and their contributions to the environment, livelihoods and the well-being, nutrition, households and global economies, fisheries governance, Across all this, we paid particular attention to the role of women. And the gender aspect of small scale. The Illuminating Hidden Harvest team developed a rigorous methodology. In-country experts used this methodology to look beyond official sources of fisheries data. To collect and synthesize information about small scale fisheries. For 58 country and territory case studies spanning Africa, Asia, Oceania, Europe, 
and the Americas. Countries will prioritize this on the importance of their fishery sector. In terms of employment, production and nutrition. All researchers attended one-on-one -on -one training sessions on the illuminating hidden harvest methodology. Covering, data gathering, compilation and documentation. A network of 28 gender advisors was engaged alongside some of the country teams. To ensure that women's contributions to small-scale fisheries were elevated in the research. The report consisted of other comprehensive data harvesting techniques, including A questionnaire responded to by 104 FAO member countries. A review of national data sets on labor force and household income and expenditure survey. And an assessment of fisheries policies and the FAO LEX database. We work with expert teams to highlight important themes. Shining the needed light on issues such as indigenous people. And the importance of identity in understanding fishers and fish workers' choices. Thanks to the contribution of more than 800 experts. New and clear insights are coming to the surface. Adding to the growing body of evidence around small-scale fisheries. We will continue to develop new methods and capacities for better data collection in the future. That governments, researchers and others can apply and refine. Critically, the elimination hide and harvest uh, knowledge will support the implementation of the small-scale fisheries guidelines. By providing key information to organizations and activists. To make a strong case for productive, sustainable and equitable small-scale fisheries for all. What a fantastic video. If this doesn't give you a feeling for the global effort, I don't know what else could do that. Uh, thank you for that. Now what, what we're going to move into the presentation phase of this webinar. Members of the IHH team will present a handful of key findings from the forthcoming IHH report, starting with a deeper look at the IHH approach. Uh, Mar, could you please kick us off? Thank you, Vera. My name is Maria del Mar Mancha Cisneros. I was postdoctoral associate at Duke University working as the technical lead for the Illuminating Hidden Harvest. And I wanna start this presentation with an overview of the IHH approach taken by the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Study, or as we call it for short, IHH. Recognizing small scale fisheries as complex socio-ecological systems, IHH took a multidisciplinary approach which is closely embedded within the Sustainable Development Goals framework, as we can see from the figure here, as well as the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries, and particularly as a response to the call for better data within the small-scale fisheries guidelines. Particularly, IHH looks at the contributions of small-scale fisheries to the three pillars of sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental with a strong focus on nutrition and governance, and with, a gen with gender as a cross-cutting dimension. The main data source for the study was a series of 58 case studies that were carried out in the countries and territories you see highlighted in the map, which were selected according to a series of indicators and that accounted for 68% of global marine catch and 62% of global inland catch according to FAO data. The country and territory case studies, which we'll refer to from now on as country case studies, were carried out by national research institutes, fisheries organizations, local and international fisheries experts for a total of more than 800 contributors with the objective to compile available data and information on small scale fisheries at country level, including official statistics, surveys, and expert knowledge and following a standard protocol provided by the IHH team. Gender focal points were also identified within the countries to support the case study experts on data collection to flush out all available data and knowledge on gender and small scale fisheries, including gender disaggregated data to estimate contributions by women and men in small scale fisheries. For example, in terms of fisheries labor and highlight specific gaps and limitations in the available data. 
Other data sources were used to complement and fill gaps, as well as triangulate our country case study data. And these included an ad hoc questionnaire on small scale fisheries that was sent to FAO member countries and territories for which we received 104 responses, as well as other existing global and regional databases, literature reviews, labor force surveys, and household income and expenditure surveys. Finally, specific thematic studies were also carried out in order to highlight key aspects of small scale fisheries that cannot be quantified at global level. For example, a study on indigenous peoples and identity. As we all know, there is no internationally agreed definition of small scale fisheries. Therefore, the IHH study did not prescribe a definition for it. Instead, country case study experts were instructed to use the most commonly used definition for small-scale fisheries in their country for data compilation. However, the IHH study did use a tool called the characterization matrix that allowed us to score each fishery included in the study according to a series of characteristics such as gear use, motorization, distance from shore, and so on to place them along a continuum between small scale and large scale fisheries, and to give a better sense of what we are really looking at when we talk about small scale fisheries in the study. Finally, data compiled through the different approaches were analyzed and extrapolated to produce global estimates of the key indicators, such as catch and employment, but also used to gain better insights on issues that are very important for small scale fisheries at different spatial scales such as the national or subnational level, in addition to those aspects highlighted in the thematic studies that cannot be quantified at global level, yet recognizing the high diversity of small scale fisheries. We want to take the opportunity to thank the IHH Technical Advisory Group who advised on the design, the analysis and interpretation of the results all throughout the way. As mentioned earlier, the IHH study took a multidisciplinary approach illustrated by this diagram and put a stress on the interconnections among the different dimensions and related questions in order to draw a holistic picture of small scale fisheries to highlight their overall contributions, benefits and impacts. And by looking at the data through the lens of different disciplines at the same time, we will hear more details on the results of some of the analysis undertaken within IHH in the rest of the webinar. Starting with the first question, how much fish comes from small scale fisheries? With this, I am going to leave the floor to Nicolas Gutierrez for his presentation on harvesting and the environmental dimensions of the IHH study. Over to you, Nico. Thank you very much, Mar. I am Nicolas Gutierrez. I'm a senior fishery officer in FAO and a core team member of the AKH initiative. So let's start uh, by highlighting some key results on the harvesting and environmental dimensions of small scale fisheries. And particularly, we need to first understand what is the contribution of small scale fisheries to the global fisheries catch. In this bar, we see total global fisheries catch estimated by the hidden harvest study with a total of 92.1 million tons from which 40% or almost 37 million tons are coming from small scale fisheries or SSF and 60% from the large scale fishery sector or LSF. However, if we look at these patterns at the regional level, we see that the share of small scale fisheries catch is highly variable across regions, being highest in Africa and Asia with 66 and 47% respectively, and lowest in Europe with only 5% of the total catch coming from the small scale fisheries sector. Now, let's take a look at how small scale fisheries catch are distributed between marine and inland sectors. At the global level, in our study, 68% of total catches come from marine small scale fisheries, and the other third come from inland small scale fisheries. Again, when looking at regional patterns, almost half of the catch in Africa comes from the inland sector, highlighting the absolute importance of these fisheries for the continent. For the Americas and intuitively in Oceania, the importance of the inland fishery sectors in terms of catch volumes is quite low, between 5 and 10%. The next question is how are different species groups represented in small scale fisheries catch? And identifying fisheries catch at the species or higher taxonomic level 
has an absolute and positive impact in how these fisheries are monitored, are assessed, and are managed. However, only 63% of the marine small-scale fisheries catches and 40% of inland small-scale fisheries catches have been identified Nico, it appears we have some issues with your sound. Yes, now it's better? Yes, now we can hear you okay. again. So from this uh, sample that we were discussing, carp, tilapia, and small pelagic species dominated the inland reported catch. And it is important to note that the generally poor quality of reporting at the species level in inland fisheries several limits deeper analysis of the resilience of inland fisheries and of their economic and nutritional importance. Now we can see here as well for the marine small scale fisheries, the most represented species groups included small pelagics, such as sardines, herrings, and anchovies, and other pelagic fish, such as mackerels, scats, and tuna. And together, these species add up to almost 50% of the total marine small scale fisheries catch. As you will see in the following presentation, illuminating hidden harvest is a lot more. Uh, about small scale fisheries and understanding their contributions to global fish catches. The amount, the quality and granularity of the information collected has allowed us to tackle many other questions to better understand these harvesting and environmental dimensions of small scale fisheries. For instance, we have data that allow us to disaggregate catches by species, years, fleets and ecosystems. We also have information that can provide a global synthesis of small scale fisheries fleets, including catch efficiencies and the nature and scale of the operations. For example, the crew size, the distance from shore of the fishing activity, as well as other factors such as uh, the use of onboard refrigeration. We also are using available data, previous slide, sorry. We're also using available data and literature reviews to better understand small scale fisheries interactions with the environment, for example, in detrimental effects to critical habitats and the impacts of small scale fisheries on vulnerable species, including threatened species. And we also shed some light into the impacts of climate change in small scale fisheries, including some policy recommendations on mitigation and adaptation strategies. So to come back to our initial question, how much fish comes from small scale fisheries? We found that 37 million tons or 40% of the global catch originates from small scale fisheries. And now my colleague, John, will look uh, into the people behind this catch to better understand how many people actually depend on small scale fisheries uh, for their livelihoods. Uh, over to you, John. Great, thanks Nico, and hi everybody. I'm John Verdon at Duke's Nicholas Institute. And as Nico mentioned, um, I have the pleasure of presenting to you on behalf of a number of great colleagues and contributors that you see here on the slide. And we've tried to answer the question, how many livelihoods around the world depend on small scale fisheries? And so to do that, we have extrapolated from 78 national household-based surveys to estimate that worldwide, 60 million people are employed along the value chain in small scale fisheries, either part-time or full-time in the year 2016. And that this represents some 90% of all employment in capture fisheries worldwide. So just to repeat from the estimates, small scale fisheries provide 90% of all employment in capture fisheries around the world at some point along the value chain. Uh, but then in addition to that, going beyond, um, these surveys have shown us that beyond those employed in small scale fisheries, another 53 million people participated in these fisheries for subsistence fishing at least once during the year in 2016. And so in total, 113 million people that year were either employed in small scale fisheries or participated in them for subsistence at some point during the year. But then the surveys allowed us to go a little farther and look at the additional members of their households 
to get another 379 million people around the world in these households that are uh, supported by small scale fisheries for a total of globally in the year 2016, 492 million people, at least uh, partially dependent on small scale fisheries for their livelihoods. And to give you a sense of the scale of this, this was about 7% of the global population in 2016. Or <clears throat> if you look at lower income countries around the world where small scale fisheries are more prevalent, in uh, the 45 countries characterized as least developed countries in 2016, small scale fisheries uh, at least partially supported the livelihoods of an estimated 13% of the population in these countries. So really playing a significant role in, in some of the lower income countries around the world. Now we've also tried to go beyond the livelihoods to get a sense of what is the size of the economic pie supported by small scale fisheries so to speak, or what is the scale of the economic benefits that these fisheries generated? So we took as an indicator, one of the more readily available pieces of information, which is what were the total revenues generated by the first sale of the catch from small scale fisheries? And on average, each year over our study period that you see here, the first sale of the catch of small scale fisheries generated some 77 billion in revenues, mostly, uh, uh, between the marine small scale fisheries and also a significant portion there in inland small scale fisheries. And if we look at how this compares to large scale fisheries, for the 58 countries where we had case studies, on average, small scale fisheries generated about 44% of total revenues from the first sale of all fish catch that you see here. Now, going beyond again, uh, just small scale fisheries and looking at the wider ocean economy to try to put these numbers into context a little bit. We often hear about these large and growing industries in the ocean economy. But if we just take for the marine small scale fisheries, the revenues from the first sale of the catch, if we took the revenues generated just by the harvesting segment of the value chain. We see that marine small scale fisheries stack up uh, pretty well squarely in the middle of some of the world's biggest ocean based industries here bigger perhaps than, than cruise tourism, ports, wind, uh, up there with shipbuilding and though dwarfed by offshore oil and gas, the largest industry in the ocean. But marine small scale fisheries, the oldest industry perhaps, fairly well situated there in, in the ocean economy just on the basis of revenues. Now in the, in the economic chapter of the report coming out and looking at socioeconomic aspects, of small scale fisheries and their contribution to sustainable development. We've also tried to look at the role of small scale fisheries and in international trade, drawing from some of these country case studies to get a sense of how much of the catch was exported in a number of countries. And we've tried to take a deeper dive into the role of subsistence fishing in small scale fisheries. Um, again, using a number of case studies. And then finally, through these national household based surveys, we've been able to disaggregate some of the employment and subsistence data along the value chain, particularly by gender. So I think they'll, they'll find a lot more there in the chapter, but just to wrap up and review, as Nico mentioned, we're estimating that 40% of the world's fisheries catch comes from small scale fisheries. And we're estimating that 492 million people are at least partially dependent on small scale fisheries for their livelihoods or about 7% of the global population in 2016. And now I'm gonna to pass to my colleague, Sarah, who's going to talk about some of our work on looking at how women contribute to and benefit from small scale fisheries. So Sarah, over to you. Thanks, John. Hello everyone. My name is Sarah Harper and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Victoria. I'm also the co-lead on the gender theme of the Illuminating Hidden Harvest Initiative. Um, I'm presenting today on behalf of my co-lead, Danica Cliver, and many other wonderful people who are listed here on the slide who contributed their insights, knowledge, and expertise on gender and small-scale fisheries for this study. So small scale fisheries cannot be understood without considering gender and considering gender in the sector means confronting the persistent absence of women in the already meager data available on small scale fisheries. 
For example, in Nigeria, net making is considered an extension of women's reproductive or household activities and therefore not considered or included in census ease of fisheries employment. This quote is from IHH gender advisor and country case study lead for Nigeria and highlights one of numerous reasons for the persistent gender data gap in small scale fisheries. In this study, we set out to estimate the contributions by women and men to small scale fisheries and to understand why gender disaggregated data and especially those that highlight the contributions by women are so limited. In this project, we were able to provide a much more robust set of gender disaggregated data by bringing together the diverse data sets and sources, which showed that an estimated 45 million women participate in small scale fisheries value chains globally, which represents 40% of total estimated small scale fisheries labor. This means that out of every 10 people that participate in small scale fisheries, four are women that are either working for pay or fishing for home consumption. Broken down by segments of the value chain or subsector, women represent just over 15% of pre-harvest labor, such as gear fabrication and repair, bait and ice provisioning and boat building. They represent 19% of commercial harvest labor when you include vessel and non-vessel based activities that are recorded. By contrast, women represent half of those engaged in the post-harvest sector. This includes processing, transporting, trading, selling, and other related activities. And women represent 45% of subsistence fishing laborers. Other highlights from this chapter include that women are overrepresented in rarely accounted for fisheries labor, especially informal and unpaid activities, including subsistence fishing, such as gleaning and informal activities that support fishing businesses and operations. While women um, participate in small scale fisheries in substantial numbers, they're underrepresented in governance arenas and face many barriers to meaningful participation in management and decision making. Finally, in many contexts, women, and especially certain groups of women, have less access to, but stand to disproportionately benefit from small scale fisheries, especially income and nutrition related benefits. In the next presentation, we'll hear more about the distribution of nutrition related benefits of small scale fisheries, including those that relate to gender. So now that we've highlighted the substantial labor contributions by women to small scale fisheries, I'm going to hand um, the floor over to my colleague, Dave Mills, um, for his presentation on nutrition and small scale fisheries to, that addresses the key question, how is small scale fisheries catch important to nutrition? So thanks. And over to you, Dave. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, as Sarah said, my name is Dave Mills. Um, I work on fisheries sustainability and nutrition uh, with Worldfish and have been the coordinator of this fantastic group of authors represented on this slide here. In the years since the uh, first hidden harvest report, the nutrition contribution of small scale fisheries has increasingly come into focus. This has been driven to varying degrees by the sustainable development goals, as well as the strong voice of fishers and their organisations through the small scale fisheries guidelines. The IHH initiative provides a unique opportunity to illustrate this contribution and develop methods that can improve the incorporation of nutrition into fisheries management. One of the key methodological innovations employed in this study was predictive modelling of the nutri nutrition nutrient composition of fish. Conducting analysis of the nutri nutrient composition of fish in the laboratory is extremely expensive. Um, and the data is only available for a very small number of species globally. However, using predictive modeling, we can use the characteristics of the fish that we do know the nutrient composition for to predict nutrient composition of any species. The characteristics we use are shown on the left hand side in this slide. As a spin off from this and other linked work, these models have been incorporated into FishBase, and now anyone can access the modeled nutrient values for use in research or in management. Using the detailed landings data, uh, back one slide, please. 
using the detailed landings data for um, IHH country case studies, we looked at the relative nutrition value of different fish groups. We found that while all fish provide a, a great diversity of macro and micronutrients, there are some uh, substantial differences as illustrated in the slide here. You can see the uh, nutrient values in the bars. Um, and there are some definite hero species. This graph shows the potential of 100 gram serving of fish flesh for each group to the recommended nutrient intakes of six nutrients for women of reproductive age. The most nutritious fish with the best diversity of nutrients were small fish and most commonly those living in midwater or pelagic fish. These are also often the most available and affordable fish to rural populations. We then applied these predicted nutrient values to the IHH regional extrapolations for small scale fisheries catches to estimate regional nutrient yields. Direct nutrient yield numbers can be a bit uh, tricky to understand, so we express these numbers, uh, we express, express these as numbers of people for whom small scale fisheries catches could meet recommended nutrient intakes. Given uh, that a healthy diet contains multiple food groups, we look at how fish can contribute as part of a diverse diet. Omega-3 fatty acids, important for brain development and growth in infants, and to protect against heart disease in adults, are only available from a very limited number of food sources, of which um, fish would be the greatest. The omega-3 fatty acids uh, in small-scale fisheries landings could provide 50% of the recommended daily intake to 150 million women in Africa and 773 million women in Asia. Similarly, the total nutrient yield from small scale fisheries landings could provide 20% of the recommended daily intake across the four most abundant nutrients, calcium, selenium, zinc, and omega-3s for 137 million women in Africa and 271 million in Asia. In addition to this modeling approach, the IHH team worked with the case study teams to identify high quality nutrient data outcomes uh, in the case studies, but this type of data were rare. In a few data bright spots, we undertook in-depth analysis to answer questions about who benefits from the nutrition value of small scale fisheries. For example, as shown here in Zambia, we were able to use national scale consumption survey data to show that fish are particularly important in maintaining dietary diversity among Zambian children. As shown here, only 18% of children showed adequate dietary diversity, defined as consuming five or more food groups in a meal. However, meat was particularly important, so the flesh foods um, were particularly important in maintaining this dietary diversity and are the fifth most consumed food shown here in this graph. Um, and of this, of this meat, 58% consumed, uh, consumed by children is fish. This reinforces the critical nature of fish, and in this case from inland small-scale fisheries, in supporting positive nutrition outcomes among vulnerable groups. Also included in the nutrition chapter, um, is an anal analysis of major food safety issues and factors that can improve safety outcomes in small scale fisheries value chains. A detailed look at the importance of small scale fisheries in the first 1000 days of life uh, with case study analysis and case studies on how improved nutrition data can illuminate key areas for management and investment to support the important nutrition outcomes from small scale fisheries. So from this presentation, uh, you have seen that small scale, small scale fisheries are often particularly important for nutrition and small fish from these fisheries in particular. Um, that fish from small scale fisheries have the potential to make considerable contributions to nutrition, even at the scale of uh, nations and regions. Uh, that fish can very quick, can, can be very important in the diets of vulnerable rural populations and groups. And we've illustrated that notably for children. So to maintain and build these critical nutrition functions of small scale fisheries, reforms are needed that put nutrition outcomes squarely at the center of management approaches. This is only possible when people centered human rights approaches to management can be implemented. 
And here I will hand over to Javier Baserto um, to bring some of the highlights of the governance research in the IHH initiative into focus. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Javier Basurto. I'm one of the co-principal investigators of the IHH Research Initiative and led the world at the work related to governance with the support of an excellent group of colleagues and students. All of the contributions you just heard about are embedded in a huge diversity of governance systems around the world. Here, we provide a first synthesis of the patterns emerging from the study of hundreds of small scale fisheries around the world. I focus on key messages related to the contributions of fishing organizations, status of co-management and the policy level of influence of co-management. Regarding fishing organizations, we created a database of more than 700 fishing organizations of different types. About 400 of them are producer organizations represented by the red dots. And I am focusing on those here. We did a study of the goals of those fishing organizations and we compared them to the themes of the Moscow Fisheries Guidelines. We found not surprisingly that practically all organizations expressed goals related to harvesting and sustainable fisheries management. What was more interesting and less expected perhaps was that 60% of those organizations also expressed goals related to human well being, whether it was related to labor rights, food security, or to human and environmental health. So three points emerge from this analysis. One is that indeed there is high alignment between the goals of fishers and the goals of the small scale fisheries guidelines, which shouldn't be surprising because the guidelines were the result of an extensive consultation process and therefore should be an expression of fishers aspirations. The second point is that fishers see high compatibility between sustainable fisheries management and human well-being. And the third point, and perhaps most relevant, is that fishers see themselves as active contributors to the implementation of the Moscow Fisheries Guidelines and not passive recipients of state action. The second study was related to the global status of co-management. That study was made possible because we were able to link policies with the amount of catch that those policies govern. And that way we were able to gain a sense of the relevance or the importance of policies in terms of the catch each policy influenced. In this case, it was the amount of catch under co-management provisions. And so for 55% of the global small scale fisheries catch, we were able to determine that for every 10 tons of catch, there is formal co-management provisions in four of them. And for two tons, there is the perception by experts that there is high participation of fishers. In other words, for every 10 tons, there is four for which there are formal management provisions and two where implementation is thought to be happening. Now, we disaggregated the data by world regions, and we see that Africa shows the highest gap between catch with co-management provisions and catch with high engagement co-management or implementation. The third study focused in finding which policies supported most co-management. At the national level, we see the same proportion that I described before. Same at the subnational level. Now, the different size of fish is to remind us that more catch is under the influence of national level policies. At the local level, we see that this proportion flips. There are more, many more policies with formal co-management provisions and higher perception of implementation of co-management on the ground. So the lessons that emerge are these. We see evidence that fishers are active contributors to the implementation of the guidelines. Co-management is on the rise compared to 30 years ago. However, much more remains to be done to turn what is in writing to implementation on the ground. Most co-management comes from local level policies, while national level policies often do not include co-management provisions. So a better alignment is needed between national and local policies in terms of co-management. This is important because facilitating the participation of fishers in decision-making processes at local as well as national levels is key to strengthen the implementation of the small scale fisheries guidelines. And strengthening the implementation of the guidelines is key to catalyze the numerous contributions that small scale fisheries make to sustainable development, as you have heard and seen throughout this presentation. 
Other analysis included in the governance chapter, which I have no time to present today, are shown in this slide. So in closing, findings from the governance chapter indicate that progress has been made. Next slide, please. Yet more work remains to be done to increase the participation of fishers, which is needed to realize the interlinked contributions small scale fisheries can make to sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Really very, very deep, rich, crisp and clear presentations. And I'm very well aware, and let me tell all of you that this only scratches the surface. You know, I'm excited to see, we could see interlinkages between uh, the different presentations. And as I said, this is really only one example of many existing and possible connections that really illuminate the contributions of small scale fisheries to sustainable development. So um, really we are confident that further reshape exploring these connections will help reshape the narrative around small scale fisheries and related policy recommendations. The IHH report that will be launched next year aims to contribute to this. So we're all very excited and waiting with bated breath for that report. Now, during the presentations, you may have noticed that lots of questions have rolled in. So we now get to the part of this webinar where we're going to spend some time responding to questions. And if we don't have time to reply to all the questions here now, we will take note of them and we'll provide a full set of written responses later. Now, um, I'm going to go over the team is helping to um, collate questions coming in from you. I have not been able to monitor the chat, so I'm going to go over to the document that the team is assembling and start. Um, let's see, we have a question, a question for Mar. Let's start there. How were the case countries, uh, case study countries selected? Uh, Mar, if you could take that one. Thanks, Vera. Yes, happy to. Um, to select the country case studies, um, we applied a methodology following a list of selection criteria that considered two main aspects, their country's absolute importance to fisheries, so at the global level, as well as the relative importance of fisheries, that is, at the country level. Um, and this helped us identify which were the priority countries that we wanted to focus on for the case study. So using available data, mainly um, FAO data, we ordered countries based on their fisheries production levels, employment in fisheries, and role of fish protein for food security, um, as well as, yeah, so try to achieve a balance also in terms of geographic representation. And based on that list, we selected which countries to prioritize and, and do a case study on. Thank you very much. That was very clear. Um, the next question is for Nico. Nico, how is the definition of small scale fisheries impacting final catch figures? And what is the difference between small scale and artisanal fishing, fisheries? Thank you, Vera, and thank you for the question. Uh, as we all know, there, there is no universal definition of, of artisanal or, or small scale fisheries or aquaculture. And, and in general, these, these terms describe fisheries or aquaculture system that use relatively small production units with relatively low input or low output, limited levels of technology, etc. cetera. Uh, for the purpose of this study and also for the purpose of the IAFA, uh, the international year of artisanal fisheries, small scale and artisanal are used interchangeably. Uh, note uh, um, also that as there's no universal agreed definition of small scale fisheries, we allow country case study experts to use their own legal or operational definitions for their own countries. However, we also requested them, as you see from our presentation, to score their fisheries based on the characterization matrix approach. And that allow us to place small scale fisheries in a continuum from zero smallest scale to 23 or 25 for the largest scale. Uh, again, although there's no universal cutoff within that continuous, uh, we assume that small scale fisheries that score greater than 20 and 21 can be somehow associated to a larger scale sector. And to answer particularly the question of how that impacts the final catches, in our study, less than 5% of the catch was associated to that higher score fisheries 
which could be associated with a larger or a mid uh, scale uh, fisheries. Uh, thank you and over to you, Vera. Thank you, Nico. Uh, the next set of questions relates to how some of the key findings compare with previous estimates and the Hidden Harvest 2012 the study. Start with John. John, uh, someone would like to know how the key findings, for example, in employment compare with previous estimates in the Hidden Harvest 2012. Yeah, thanks, Vera. They're fairly comparable to the previous estimates. Uh, the 2012 Hidden Harvest had 108 million people participating in small scale fisheries, including subsistence or employment. We have 113 here, so somewhat comparable. Also, the part-time, full-time employment in capture fisheries that we have uh, on the order of uh, just over 30 million, comparable to, to FAO's estimate of about 31.7 million, with a difference there likely explained by different estimates from, from China. Um, what I think is really interesting here is that we've been able to get more of this detail on subsistence fishing and have this this estimate that 53 million people are engaged solely for subsistence fishing and just illustrates, I think for us, the role that small scale fisheries play as a safety net for so many people in so many places around the world. So that's that's a, a contribution that I'm, we're pretty excited about having a little bit more granularity around subsistence fishing. Yes, indeed, I would fully agree with you. So thank you for that, John. Really great to, to see some of those figures. Uh, now, Nico, for you, a similar questions, you know, how do the key findings on catch compare with previous estimates, Hidden Harvest 2012, but also the FAO State of the World Report? Thank you, Vera. Uh, first, I would like to, to stress that comparing our HHA figures with other attempts should be done with caution. The methodologies and specifically the time frames may differ substantially between two different approaches. Uh, for instance, our figures correspond to average values between 2013 and 2017, and therefore are considered a snapshot of the uh, for example, uh, total catches um, from small scale fisheries. Uh, we were not attempted to uh, devise temporal trends in catch. Uh, this approach will rely on too many assumptions that will introduce uncertainties that uh, cannot be reliably assessed. So despite these differences, uh, previous studies are remarkably close uh, as have estimated marine catches between 21 and 34 million tons. Uh, for instance, for the first hidden harvest, figures for 20, uh, 2004 and, 20, and 2007 resulted in 34 million tons compared with 25 million tons. And the share of small scale fisheries in the total fisheries catch from the previous hidden harvest was 46% compared to 40% of our study. However, we have to stress that uh, our current methodology and study has addressed many of the shortcomings identified from the previous hidden harvest. Therefore, we are pretty confident about our, our figures. Uh, for the inland uh, fisheries, it's a different story. We come up with 12 million tons, which are very close to FAO statistics, as inland fisheries as you know, are mainly small scale fisheries. And also we use some of the FAO data for gap filling instead of using the modeling approach as done for the marine data set. Uh, we uh, also acknowledge that we couldn't eliminate some of the lowest and most dispersed uh, levels of inland fishing. So there is a gap between what IHHA could uncover from the national data and information system and what is missing from uncollected uh, food fishing, seasonal activities, and, and gleaning uh, foraging. Uh, in terms of the FAO statistics, we have had, by adding up small-scale and large-scale fishery sector, we come to a figure that is quite close to the FAO figures, uh, which is only 2% higher than what is reported. However, uh, both the local experts involved in the data collection and independent experts consulted through a questionnaire highlighted that small scale. Uh oh, Nico, we lost you. I'm back. Yes. OK. OK, so um, as, as I was saying, uh, independent 
local expert and independent experts uh, highlighted the, uh, the underreported nature of many of the small scale fisheries. Therefore, in order to better capture the full contribution of small scale fisheries to global cat, unemployment and nutrition, et cetera, we need to put additional resources to improve the long-term capacity development for data collection, for curation, and for analysis at the country level. Thank you, Vera. Over to you. Thank you, Nico. And I could not agree with you more on uh, more resources to improve that data collection. So thank you for that. Uh, the next question is for you, Sarah, related to the same set. Uh, how do the key findings on gender compare with the previous estimates and the hidden harvest 2012? And in particular, is there an estimate of how the number or percent women in the small scale fishery chain has changed over time? Thanks, Vera. Yeah, that's a great question and, um, and one that I think will come up a lot with this work. Um, of course, um, as Nico highlighted or um, Nicholas highlighted that, uh, you know, there should be caution in comparing these because they were different methodologies used. Um, that being said, I don't think that the, the difference from the 2012 study, which um, suggested 46% of women participate in small scale fisheries compared to the 40% that we presented today, um, suggests necessarily a, a decrease in participation. Rather, it, it represents um, different methodologies. We used a, a larger sample size. Um, and more importantly, even though we were able to bring forward much more robust estimate this time, um, there's still many reasons why the contributions by women are um, overlooked, underreported. And we really drill into that in, in the findings and in the chapter. And that was really fleshed out by some of the great gender advisors that brought their expertise from working on the ground and in, in data collection and that kind of thing. So, um, so I think in terms of a comparison, you know, it, it would be great if we had the same methodology to compare sort of that difference over time, um, but it really reinforces the need for um, that regular collection of gender disaggregated data. So um, thanks, Vera, and back over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, definitely great to hear about your gender advisor. I think that that's really one of the strengths of this study. And, and also a few of you are pointing out to the methodologies issues. I think the, the caution on comparing numbers is heard and really a good one. We all tend to gravitate towards numbers and want to compare, but absolutely methodologies and, and needs, needs to be really carefully considered before we do that, one does that. Um, the next question is for Dave. Uh, Dave, how much variation do you think there is in nutritional value within a species between different places? Yeah, thanks, Vera. Um, that's an interesting and very topical question. So this whole area of the, uh, the nutritional analysis of fish is, is really um, sort of a rapidly evolving um, area of study. And so there's where, where sort of these models are evolving over time and the, the version I talked about having built into Fishbase is actually set up so that new data can be plugged in very regularly as, as new um, research groups are analysing different fish species and so on around the globe. Um, at the moment, the, there's very few species for which there would be enough data to actually look at geographic variation within species. Um, I know there are some specific studies that have looked at this. Um, but I think as, as the years, you know, over the next few years, at the rate this data is coming in now, we'll really start to get a better picture of that. Um, also, I think if we look at the differences between species now as we model them, we see that differences in, say, thermal regime um, or, or sort of longitudinal, latitudinal differences in where species, different species live um, are really strong determinants of nutrient um, quantities within fish flesh. So um, there's every reason to think they would have an impact within a species, but uh, these are questions that we, we're yeah, excited about answering over the next few years. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Um, definitely uh, points the path towards what, what we need to, how we need to enhance and add in the next few years. Always good to also have a set of those kind of reflections. Uh, there are some really great questions, Rolien. We have another one here for Javier. Uh, are there any examples of co-management mechanisms at national level? How specific can national level policies get regarding, get regarding co-management 
given that details need to be specific to the local context. Thank you, Vera. Um, yes, there are examples of co-management at the national level. Uh, the the co-management policies that we see at the local level are quite specific, as the um, the question implies, and they're, they they to be specific and related to the context. Those that we find at the national level are quite general. They outline uh, whether fishers can participate, um, and at, at the most, whether how, how they can participate, what forms of participation, whether it's advisory uh, or binding. But but it, in general, they they don't go to more detail than that. Thank you, Xavier. Um, we now have a question for Mar, and again, these questions are, are great, really shows that we have an engaged audience. Um, Mar, is the research reproducible at national local scale, and can the data generated be used for benchmarking? Thanks, Vera. Yes, that's a great question. And the answer is yes. A, a very important aspect of the IHH methodology was to have a protocol that could be applied in any country and at different scales. Of course, with the IHH study, our goal uh, first was to able to produce estimates of these key indicators at the national level um, that we could then use to produce global estimates. So, um, but the approach itself could be applied at subnational and local scales as well. Um, the methodology was designed to be flexible enough so that different countries who undoubtedly will have different national reporting systems and different data collection systems would be able to, to implement and, and adapt it. Um, and apply it to compile the minimum information necessary for estimating these key indicators. We were very closely with each country team to ensure that we, we were allowing for these tweaks and, and levels of flexibility so that they could actually um, provide the information that was crucial for, for these estimations. So um, yes, I think it's, it's reproducible. Um, it could be adapted at different scales. <clears throat> and you can generate data that can be used for benchmarking. This will be available as part of the, the IHH report, the IHH methodology that we followed, um, thoroughly explained. And we're also working on other educational aspects to, to highlight this methodology, such as e-learning courses and so on, that people can then just take on and, and use and apply it at different scales. Thank you for that. Definitely the connection, the, the really close connection to, to uh experts on the ground, practitioners is one of the, another one of the great strengths that I love about this study. Um, John, next for you. Um, and the question is, small scale fishermen usually allocate time to other activities to, to complement income household. Was this evaluated to get a better understanding of the fisheries activity in the household income, multidimensional poverty and vulnerability? Yes, absolutely. That's a great point because we've tried to emphasize that so many small scale fishers have multiple occupations and that small scale fishing is part of very diverse livelihood strategies for so many. So we haven't necessarily quantified that in our global estimates, but one of the things that we do in the report is we try to dive into a number of case studies where we can get a little bit more finer detailed data from some of these surveys just to show how many small scale fishers are really participating in multiple livelihoods, particularly often between agriculture and, and fishing and, and back and forth, just to emphasize again that these really are functioning as a safety net that people can, can go into and out of uh, depending on seasons and seasonality or, or other factors. Thank you, very interesting. Um, Dave, question for you. The study of nutritional value and needs focused on women and children, and with respect to the former, women of reproductive age. Could you say a bit more about those decisions and what ideas about gender shaped your approach to incorporating gender in your methodology? Yeah, um, great question. Um, so I guess, um, Fundamentally, we're looking at the uh, contribution of nutrition to vulnerable groups within the community, but also to groups where the benefits from the nutrition from small scale fisheries can have a lasting impact on populations. Um, and particularly, I, I guess also relating to that is where uh, the nutrients perhaps are not as readily available from other sources for particular stages of life. 
So um, omega threes, as I mentioned in the um, in, in the presentation, are uh, particularly hard to find from other sources and often aren't as bioavailable in those other sources where they are there. And, and they're particularly important to brain and uh, early development in children. Um, interestingly, for the women of reproductive age, in terms of what I presented, that was just used as a framing for the nutrient values um, because each stage of life or each population group actually has different recommended daily uh, nutrient intakes and so we really just had to choose a group and so again choosing a vulnerable group where the uh, nutrient availabilities from fish can have particular impact um, we settled on on using uh, the framing of women of reproductive age in that case um, but yeah uh, fundamentally it's about the vulnerable groups and where this nutrition where these uh, exceptional nutrition qualities of fish can have have a lasting impact on populations Thank you for that. Uh, Javier, we're going back to you now. Uh, can giving territorial user rights to fishing communities help in securing sustainable management? Yes, and, and there's plenty of evidence showing that. Um, it's, not, it's not the only um, policy tool um, that will you know, increase the probability of sustainable management. But um, when, when fishers have property rights over a particular um, piece of water and that property is multi-year, they, they start to make longer term investments um, in their fish and the sustainability of their fisheries. Fishing concessions in Mexico um, and other examples around the world are, are available. Yeah. Thank you, Javier. Uh, now there's a question for Mar. Uh, what were the main challenges with collecting the data? Uh, do you feel that you actually discovered the hidden? I think this was meant to be hidden. It says unhidden, but I would say that this is probably hidden. Yes, thank you, Vera. Great question as well. Um, I mean, as we all know, small scale fisheries may not have the same resources dedicated to information collection in different parts of the world. But even so, we, we found that there is a surprising amount of information that can be uncovered at national levels, especially looking at unconventional places um, beyond just um, the, the official resources. There's many, there's a plethora of information um, that we found in, in many cases um, that doesn't always get into national reporting. We, so we, we're confident that we did uncover the bulk of the small scale marine fishery catch but perhaps less so for inland fisheries. Um, and also for, especially for seasonal food fisheries and gleaning fisheries um, that usually do not make it into, into a lot of the reporting. Um, although our case study experts did a fantastic job in a, being able to track down all the existing data down that, 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 that was available to their countries, I think it's still clear that there remains more to know and the elusive information on the most dispersed and the smallest smallest scale fisheries activities and it requires a specific um, focused information gathering effort at the national level so yeah thank you um, john back to you uh, the question is as follows developing countries political discourses are talking about strengthening their blue economy and it is often framed around increasing gdp and the contribution of the ocean but one rarely sees SSS flagged as a key part of the picture and as a key for their blue economy with all its contributions as touched on in the presentation. Through the wide range of case studies, did you see SSF better positioned in some countries compared to others? Yeah, this is a great question, particularly as, as you mentioned, and as the viewer mentioned that the blue economy or ocean economy has become such a priority in so much policy discourse. We haven't looked at this, say, country by country, but we've started to try to use some of these findings to illustrate how, how significant and just the scale of the small scale fishing activity in the context of these blue economy aspirations. And that's why we presented, for example, revenues from the first sale of the catch, which shows small scale fisheries as comparable to many of the largest industries in the ocean economy. Uh, not all certainly, but right there well positioned to show this is a, a central part of economic activity in the ocean space. We don't have 
directly comparable numbers, but numbers that would suggest that probably small scale fisheries are the ocean's largest employer and perhaps uh, it's certainly bigger than any of the other industries in the ocean economy or blue economy. So if you have employment objectives from the ocean economy, blue economy, you really probably should be talking about small scale fisheries. Absolutely, thank you for that. I remember discussing a similar issue with you when you were here back in Rome a couple of years ago uh, for one of your meetings. So thank you for that good answer. Uh, Javier, back to you. Uh, what are the key criteria to classify small-scale fisheries? What are the key criteria for to classify small-scale fisheries? Um, that is a tricky question and very important. Um, I think in, in, in our study, we used, we let countries to define small-scale fisheries. Uh, but we used a characterization matrix, which used a range of criteria um, to understand what was in the definition or what was um, a small scale fishery. Um, in many places, technology has been um, key defining criteria, but we would, went beyond that. Uh, we included technological issues such as, you know, size of the motor, uh, but we also went beyond um, and we looked at, you know, how far away from the coast they went, whether um, uh, different characteristics of the fleet and the um, people on board. Uh, so we went and looked at management, technological and operational issues to have a much broader sense of um, what this Moscow fishery looked like. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dave, we're going to come back to you. And the question here, there's a, there's a funny remark at the end. What are the top three new or continuing small scale fisheries questions for the next round and continued work by the IHH initiative, which is suggested here as IHH reloaded or revolution? So Dave, can you tell us your thoughts on that? Yes, uh, thank you, Patrick McConey, for those suggestions. Um, we've talked we've talked around IHH three with the team, and those those are I think much more suitable suggestions for a for a future name. Um, interestingly, on on the subject of IHH three, I, I guess the task ahead of us now is to continue to work with the network of people who have been involved in this and to get down uh, to work with countries um, where, where they would, would uh, appreciate this to really um, bring this down to the policy level at, at uh, the country scale. So there's a lot of work to be done there. But in terms of, of questions that uh, this round of, of um, IHH has really opened up, um, <laughs> the answer depends on who you ask, who you ask this to, I think, but uh, I've been given the floor. Um, with some input from colleagues here. So we, we had a section in the survey on the drivers of change for fisheries. And it was a sort of structured section. And um, for that reason is quite limited in scope. But I think there's some really interesting um, issues to dive into there across the spectrum of fisheries. Um, what, what are the main drivers, be they economic, environmental, etc. Um, on that note, on the environmental front, of course, climate change, um, is, is looming large and uh, we touch on it in a number of places um, in, in this study, but we can certainly take a deeper dive into the broader um, climate change impacts, of course, directly on fish stocks and so on, but also um, at a social level and, and at interactions with livelihoods and so on. There are a lot of issues around that. Um, and yeah, the, the whole um, areas of, of the dynamics and the changing seen around management and governance, um, particularly in the context of environmental change. Um, how can we really get into the country level to understand uh, what's happening there and, and where levers for positive change are, what sort of information um, is critical in that process? So I would flag that as the third one, I think. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for that for that clear thinking on that. And I should have known this question was coming from Patrick. Patrick, thank you. Always appreciate your sense of humor as well. Um, Nico, this is for you. And we have a couple more minutes, so I'll be probably be able to touch on a couple of questions. For Nico, were you able to define the main challenges facing small-scale fisheries in different parts of the world? What are the main future drivers? 
Thank you, Vera. And, and this is this is a very important, although extends uh, question. Um, many many of the challenges uh, that face small scale fisheries are related to improving uh, management and governance of their fisheries, particularly to achieve uh, the triple bottom line sustainability that is economic ecological and social sustainability. And, and as we know, there is extensive evidence that sustainability can only be achieved through effective management. And, and for effective management, we need to make sure that we have the right data and information as we have seen in, the, in, in this project, that we are inclusive and participatory, that we are adaptive, and that we have the means to enforce management regulations, either at the central government and or particularly at the local level, as we have seen from uh, uh, Javier's presentation through a community-based arrangement. Within our study, the two main drivers of change or challenges identified by the local experts were overfishing and climate change. And both of these challenges can be addressed by implementing effective management and governance arrangement. And, and on that, stay tuned, because we will be addressing questions such as what is the impact of climate change in small scale fisheries at the global level, and what kind of management and governance arrangements are most uh, suitable uh, for small scale fishery sustainability. Over to you. Thank you, Nico. Do you mean stay tuned for the IHH reloaded revolution or the launch of the report? For the launch of the report and all the secondary products that we are going to put it out there. Great, thank you. Last question. I think we have, we're almost there. I'll squeeze this one in for Javier. Is it possible that policies at the national level in any country take into account the great diversity and heterogeneity of small scale fisheries? In other words, how can frameworks at the national level have the necessary flexibility so that policies, agreements, and plans consider that small scale fishing is different between regions? Yeah, I think um, national level frameworks uh, need to allow different types of knowledge and different types of members of society participating to create and come up with solutions that are very tailored to the local level. So the national framework uh, needs to create that supporting environment for local level arrangements where different people with different types of knowledge uh, really can bring their contextual understanding to creating policies that have a better likelihood of uh, working well. Yeah, thank you for that question. That's a very important question. Thank you, Javier, for your answer. And uh, really, thank you to all of you. I, I want this kind of audience to every webinar I, I moderate. It's really very, very inspiring and, and dynamic question and answer. Thank you for all to all the panelists for, for doing such a great job at addressing these in a very crisp and clear way. Now, as the webinar draws to a close, I would like to hand over to Manuel Barange, direct director of the Fisheries and Aquaculture Division here at FAO to give the closing remarks. Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vera, and thank you all for joining us for this sneak preview of the key findings of the IHH study. Just by monitoring the chat and the Q&A of this event, I can see that the audience has been as excited and inspired by the results of the study as I have. Well done, IHH team. What a week we've had. On Friday, FAO launched the 2022 International Year of Small-Scale Fisheries and Aquaculture. Yesterday, we celebrated World Fisheries Day with events all over the world. And today, we have this sneak preview. Now, the findings shared today confirm and quantify the essential contribution of small-scale fisheries for sustainable development in relation to livelihoods, to food security and nutrition, and to resources sustainability. I would like to take the opportunity to thank the over 800 experts behind this study. They have contributed in various ways by compiling information for the 58 country and territory studies as members of the technical advisory group, as gender advisors, and of course, the colleagues from the IHH partner organizations, Wellfish and Duke University. The credibility of studies like this one relies on the credibility and diversity of its contributors and the institutions. And of course, we thank the governments of Norway and Sweden and Oak Fund Foundation for the funding support without which this study would not have been possible. 
These collective efforts have allowed us to provide updated or new global reference figures for small scale fisheries for the first time since the release of the 2012 Hidden Harvest Report. Furthermore, these new figures provide unprecedented resolution. The study confirms the importance of transcending individual disciplines to integrate different policy domains and sources of information to bring new understandings of the importance of small scale fisheries. The incorporation of nutrition and governance, which had not been covered in the previous Hidden Harvest Report, are exam examples of this integrated approach. At the same time, the study largely validates FAO official fisheries data currently available. But despite the deep dives through the country case studies, it has become clear that some data were not or not entirely available, for example, on inland fisheries or on food fishes in remote areas. And hence, a lot still remains hidden. We therefore see this IHH study as an important step in a broader global initiative to further improve methods and capacities to collect, to analyze and to use data and information on small scale fisheries and aquaculture as a basis for sound and inclusive policy making and resource governance, but also as a source of evidence on the importance of this subsector in food and livelihood security dialogues. We also hope that partnerships around the IHH project will continue to grow, and we hope that we can count on all of you in moving forward. Make no mistake, each one of the partners has learned an awful lot from each other and from the study, and this momentum must be harnessed and steered. Now to reiterate the point, this is not the end. It is just the point in the story where you turn the page. And the new page will be the launch of the full report in early 2022, during the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. There we will share much more about the methods, we'll go deeper into the findings and implications, and we will share recommendations and next steps. So stay tuned, it's going to be a bestseller. So until then, thank you to the speakers for their exciting and insightful presentations and to all of you for your attention. Over to you, Vera. Thank you, Manuel. Very well said, all the thank yous. I, I am full agreement, obviously, with you. You know, I uh, what you said here towards the end also really resonates with me that often uh, in my mind, it's as much about the output as what happens next. So we all look forward to turning the page. The launch is definitely the next page, but there's also a beyond as many of the, the experts uh, hinted to. So this is really exciting, exciting output, exciting uh, information that we'll learn more about, but also exciting because it charts a path forward on the for the IHH revolution, <laughs> as Patrick was uh, phrased it. Um, Again, thank you all. As mentioned, a Q&A document that includes answers to all your questions, along with um, some of the, uh, you know, some of the key findings, will come to you. And I'm sorry, I'm losing my um, my notes here. Um, with a, so there'll be a, a doc. There will be a document that includes answers to all your questions, along with a key findings brief. That reflects all the results presented today. We will post this on the FAO website soon. We'll notify you all when it's published so you can start using and citing the numbers in your work. In the meantime, if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to contact our, our team, uh, the IHH team at the email address that we'll put in the chat right now that we are sharing in the chat, as I said. You will also find the website link in the chat. Now, we really do hope that you will again join us next year for the full launch of the IHH report. I think we've, we've set up your expectations now enough today. Uh, during that time, we'll hear more about uh, more information on the methods along with full findings and policy recommendations. So I'm, I'm personally really excited to, to tune in for that. Uh, those recommendations will point to the actions that we all as government officials, donors, researchers, um, you know, in the community out there, civil society can take to better achieve these shared goals. But we can already know now start thinking about what is needed with regard to improving data collection and analysis and capacity development to enhance our knowledge. So again, thank you very much for joining us. 
and uh, we look forward to reconnecting with you in a few months. Thank you.